Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this session in Yale's Law, Ethics, and Animals program speaker series. Thank you especially to Noah Macy, our programs fellow, who has done so much great work in the whole speaker series and this program in particular. Uh, we're really looking forward to a great discussion today. I'm Dana Bray. I'm a senior litigation fellow here in Yale's LEAP program, and I'm pleased to moderate today's panel. To set the stage, in February 2021, seeking to address a critical gap in the current framework of international agreements, the American Bar Association called for a Convention on Animal Protection to protect the public health, environment, and animal well being. The group of international lawyers and law professors who spearheaded that ABA resolution process are now working to make the treaty a reality and to set international standards and safeguards for our treatment of animals. We are really fortunate to have several of those lawyers with us here today. This, of course, is a very timely topic because the connection between animal well being and our own has never been more clear. As our panelists will share, it was the COVID 19 pandemic that created the opportunity for the American Bar Association, which is a very large, diverse professional organization, to make the link between our treatment of animals and public health. Similarly, the climate emergency is laying bare our interconnectedness with animals, whether you think about the significant role that animal agriculture plays in causing climate change or about the, bio, the climate caused ecosystem collapses that both we and animals will face as a result. For all of these reasons, resetting our relationship with animals is a critical part of humanity's ability to respond to the crises that we're facing today. And I'm going to start out, if you don't mind, with a point of moderator's privilege. Um, I'd like to share some words from Arundhati Roy, an Indian novelist. She wrote a really excellent piece in the Financial Times in April 2020 in the early days of the pandemic. So if you can take your mind back to those extraordinary days early on in the pandemic, and her words from that time have really stayed with me. She wrote, the coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine that we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. On that note, let's turn today to the proposal for a convention on animal protection. Please put quest questions in the chat box directed to me and we'll get to as many of those as we can. We'll also leave time at the end for questions from the audience. And please, I know we're all pros at this by now, but please remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, I will very briefly, I won't be able to do them justice, introduce each of the panelists before they speak for the first time. Professor David Favor is a professor of law at Michigan State University College, where he teaches property law, animal law, and international environmental law. Professor Favor is one of the founding animal lawyers in the country. Indeed, he was one of the founders of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and he's truly a giant in international animal law. So David, none of this is a new idea for you. You have been calling for a convention on animal protection since the mid-1980s, almost 40 years ago. Could you tell us about the origins of the idea, what that early process was like, and why you've turned your attentions back to this now? Yes, Diane, I mean, thank you so much for this opportunity. The or origin of this process was uh, back in the early 1980s, indeed, when I became uh, one of the founding board members of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And we started to meet as a group and think about animals and animal welfare and how the legal system deals with it and, and what to do about that. And as a few years passed by, it, it just sort of evolved to me to become the international um, liaison, if you would, with the world to go out and attend uh, meetings that might relate to animals. And the key one was clearly CITES, uh, the Convention on uh, Endangered Species. 
And so I got permission to attend that, that meeting. I ended up attending about six of them. And that, that really opened my eyes as to what international negotiations look like and how, in fact, these, these groups of countries come together every two years or so and hold a two-week meeting and make an incredible number of decisions and, uh, and then things happen. And it's, it's a flash activity. But at uh, the second or third one that I went to, uh, I, I went there, it was about wildlife and endangered species. It wasn't about individual animals and there was no treaty anywhere that dealt with the welfare of individual animals. Uh, but one, one small portion of CITES has in it that when there's a transportation of live animals between one country and another, it must be done in a manner to make sure there are no cruelty involved in that transportation process. And we thought that was a small hook that we might be able to then have them talk about the conditions of the, the wildlife uh, when, when they're caught and before they go to get to the port and then what happens to them after they leave the port. And so we managed to get a resolution in a country to take that forward and it was just totally denied. The, the CITES people had no interest whatsoever in general welfare for individual animals. They just had that one little piece of the puzzle. So upon reflecting that it didn't seem like it was gonna work with CITES, uh, um, another gentleman who is a, a delegate from Israel actually, uh, he and I got together and decided, well, let's make our own treaty, you know, what's to stop us? Uh, rather audacious at the time, I would have to say in reflection, but you know, that's what I do. Um, so we, we wrote up a treaty. I was the primary drafter, but we had other people that looked at it and we held actually a public meeting in Geneva and a public meeting in, in uh, London and uh, ended up with the final uh, draft as you see it there. It did have the construction uh, as we are thinking about it now, but it is, is we've now redone it considerably uh, of a basic treaty and then the possibility of subsequent protocols that might deal with specific topics uh, more better. It then just sort of sat there. We thought we had an end to the country of India uh, and that India might be a good spokesperson to take this forward, but that political connection ultimately fell apart and there wasn't anything there. And at the time I, I had no actual connections uh, to various countries around the world. Uh, th this is all pre-internet. You know, you hardly know anybody uh, except if you travel to a particular country and see people in person. So it sat there a while, but then as, as the century turned, it became clear that international, that interest on an international basis in animal issues was indeed beginning to grow and get some momentum. And one of the places where that momentum occurred was within our legal institutions here in the United States. The American Bar Association, um, through the efforts of a particular woman I always admire, had, uh, created the animal loss subsection of the TIPS part of, of, um, the, of the ABA. And with that, there is now a new formal platform to talk about animals. And at the same time, I wasn't immediately aware that in the International Committee of the American Bar Association, there was also an animal group forming. So, so this, this buildup began to occur. And then about 2014, I decided it's time to dust it off and at least acknowledge that it exists and explain it and, and what I had in mind. So I wrote a law review article uh, that explained this treaty in the, in the context in which it might make sense. And since that time, that has become one of my most downloaded PDF uh, uh, articles of all the articles I've written for animal issues. And it is legally, it is literally around the world. I, I've, countries I don't know anybody in, uh, in that country are, are downloading this, this article. So then again, it came back uh, to the ABA and Raj up there in the, in the window up there and for me, um, asked me to make a presentation to the animal committee of the international section on, on this treaty because he'd seen the law review article. And um, from there, it all rolled the forward. Thank you, David. Uh, next up is Nigel Blackaby, who is a Queens counsel and a partner at the international law firm Freshfield Brookhouse Derringer, where Nigel is a global co-head of Freshfield's international arbitration group and also of the Latin America group. And I personally have had the pleasure of knowing Nigel since I was a baby lawyer at Freshfield many years ago. So it's been wonderful to reconnect through this process. Um, Nigel, my question for you, you are a deeply experienced international lawyer and you're also an animal advocate. Um, from the beginning of this process of our working towards this convention, you have brought a lot of energy and a lot of commitment to this work, including that you've led the way on a dedicated pro bono project from your law firm, which has been incredibly helpful. 
Uh, why do you believe in this project? What is the opportunity that you both as an international lawyer and an animal advocate see here? Thank you, Dana, and thank you to the Law, Ethics and, and Animals program. Now, as an international lawyer, I've seen how international law has revolutionized international investment and international trade. Um, my day job is suing or defending sovereign states in claims made under investment treaties, 90% of which have just been concluded in the last 30 years. So I know that international law could affect change and impose a single international standard for investment protection, whether that investment was in Egypt or India, Brazil or Ghana. Now, in parallel, I was working with my wife on an animal shelter we sponsor in Colombia and was shocked when local authorities tried to shut us down for spurious grounds linked to real estate development. Um, I got involved in that Colombian litigation and became ever more conscious of the huge gaps that exist for animal protection in domestic legislation. So joining those two experiences, I began to question why international law was not imposing minimum standards for animal welfare as it did for the protection of commercial investments. So I joined the ABA section on international animal law really to learn more and think about how that might affect the work that we were doing in Colombia. I saw an incomplete patchwork of treaties. As David has noted, um, we saw CITES protecting endangered species, treaties protecting biodiversity, but nothing which provided any basic protection for individual animals. And I experienced my epiphany, I think, attending David's presentation to which he referred uh, in March 2020 during the first full lockdown in the UK, where I was at the time. And this seemed to be exactly the missing piece that I'd been looking for. It was an international instrument that would require contracting states to observe minimum standards of animal welfare. But as David noted, the political timing never seemed to be right. Yet in the midst of this worst public health crisis in a century, I was thinking that maybe the political will might change. And I was reading David Quammen's excellent 2012 book, Spillover, in which he describes how each zoonotic pandemic had occurred, whether it's from AIDS to Ebola, SARS to MERS, and where he accurately predicted that the next big threat to humanity would come from a zoonotic spillover. And if each situation was examined, each one seemed to start with a basic failure to attend to animal welfare. So now it seemed clear to me that an international convention on animal welfare was not just appropriate from a moral or ethical perspective, but that it had a direct link to public health, COVID-19, and the prevention of future pandemics. And animal welfare could not be disconnected from habitat and deforestation either. So animal welfare was also intimately linked to protection of the environment. So it struck me that this was the political moment and it was fully consistent with the One Health concept supported by the UN and the CDC. In short, you couldn't have public health and environmental health unless you also attended to animal health and welfare. And that was the missing leg to the three-legged stool. Now, of course, that action that was needed can't come from the legislation of individual nation states because the issues we are addressing are global. If the spillover occurs in Asia because of poor animal welfare standards, the first infected person to get on a plane brings it to Europe and the Americas. So it's no good for a live animal either to be born in country A with high animal welfare standards if it is exported to country B for fattening and slaughter if that country has low standards. It's irrelevant if country A has high standards of animal welfare if it imports animal products from country B with low standards. So this has to be an international project. And I was very lucky to work for a law firm that has a strong international footprint where we could expand our pro bono work into regional outreach groups. So to conclude, I think the opportunity, Dana, is to bring animal welfare into the forefront of a public discussion of One Health by promoting a series of internationally binding commitments on animal welfare that will act as a foundation for later development, as David said, through protocols affecting specific animal groups. Paraphrasing Jeff Sebo in his recent book, in doing so, we're not only saving the animals, but we may also be contributing in some way to saving humanity. And that's got to be the biggest mandate any lawyer could dream of. And I'm deeply honored to have been invited to join this group of motivated specialists and, and work with you all on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Professor Joan Schaffner is a professor of law at George Washington Law School, where Z directs the GW Law Animal Welfare Pro Bono Project and recently established the new Animal Legal Education Initiative, which is a groundbreaking project with the Animal Legal Defense Fund that seeks to further develop animal law, 
both as a standalone legal discipline and also one that is fully integrated into the legal academy. Joan was a founding member of the American Bar Association Animal Law Committee, where Z has, in my view, done more work than the rest of us combined over the years. That's really extraordinary. Um, so Joan, as we've talked about, the original effort of this group was centered in the American Bar Association. Can you tell us generally about how lawyers work for animals from within the ABA and about how the ABA got behind this idea of a convention on animal protection? Thanks so much, Dana, uh, and thank you to the LEAP program. Uh, we're really excited to be here and sharing these ideas with all of you. Um, as I'm sure most all of you know, the American Bar Association is one of the largest uh, voluntary and professional organizations in the world. Its mission is to defend liberty and deliver justice, and an important part of its activity is to work for just laws. Um, as David said uh, earlier in 2004, uh, the Animal Law Committee was established in the Tort Trial and Insurance Practice Section, and its mission is to address all issues concerning the intersection of animals and the law to create a paradigm shift resulting in a just world for all. And then about 12 years later in 2016, the International Animal Law Committee was established in the International Law Section, uh, and its mission is to further animal welfare through advocacy and education. Important goals of both of these committees are to be the voice for non-human animals in the American Bar Association and to develop ABA policy that supports the establishment of just laws for all sentient beings, including non-human animals, both in the United States and internationally. So the most exciting, I think, and impactful work of the ABA Animal Law Committees is our policy work. The House of Delegates is the legislative body that formulates ABA policy through the adoption of ABA resolutions. Uh, the House of Delegates, as Dana alluded to, is very large and diverse, uh, and thus ABA resolutions generally are widely respected and as sound and nonpartisan. And once ABA policy is adopted, the ABA Government Affairs Office may advocate in support of such policy. Moreover, advocates may reference ABA policy in their various efforts to seek law reform. Uh, just to give you a background on some of the policy uh, initiatives that we've had, uh, the ABA House of Delegates has adopted about 12 now animal related resolutions, each designed to improve the well being of animals through the law. Uh, these resolutions have focused on a wide variety of issues, including adopting breed neutral laws and policies, uh, protecting the health and well being of military working dogs prohibiting the possession, sale, breeding, import, or transfer of dangerous wild animals, allowing the use of trap neuter return programs for community cats, providing law enforcement officers with comprehensive animal encounter training on the reasonable use of force, and enacting and enforcing legislation that prohibits and penalizes the possession, sale, and trade of shark fins. The most recent resolution adopted by the House of Delegates concerned an international convention on animal protection. Uh, as David and Nigel both explained, uh, the timing of David's presentation to the animal law committees proved to be quite fortuitous. Um, back in March 2020, it was also the month in which COVID-19 lockdown in the United States began, along with the UK, as Nigel said. Um, at that time, of course, no one envisioned that the pandemic would reach virtually every corner of the world and continue now for years. Um, but as the global dimensions of the pandemic became clear, support grew for a House of Delegates resolution recommending that a convention on animal protection be negotiated, given the interrelationship between public health and animal health. And so on February 22nd, 2021, the House of Delegates was presented with the resolution that urges all nations to negotiate an international convention for the protection of animals that establishes standards for the proper care and treatment of all animals to protect public health, the environment, and animal well being. Um, there was no formal opposition to the resolution, uh, and it was passed by a large majority of the House of Delegates. The accompanying report noted that the failure of society to address animal welfare has grave consequences, not just for animals, but directly for humans in our shared existence with animals on the planet. And that the One Health approach uh, that is embraced by the United Nations and the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention and others 
recognizes the health of humans and the risk of diseases spilling over to humans from animals is directly related to the health of animals, which of course in turn is directly related to human use and treatment of animals. And so we concluded that a treaty to protect animal well being is needed to provide the often missing link in the global One Health approach. Thank you, Joan. And finally, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Raj Reddy, who is the director of the Animal Law Program at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School, where he also oversees the Global Animal Law Program. Raj teaches several animal law topics, including international animal law, and chairs the International Subcommittee of the ABA Animal Law Committee. Raj, your work at the Center for Animal Law Studies has broad international reach, including that you oversee the LLM program, which attracts lawyers from all over the world who work to protect animals. So bringing that international lens to bear here, what do you see around the world that makes you think that a convention on animal protection would be both possible and useful? Uh, thanks so much, Dana, for that really kind introduction and to Lee for providing a platform for us to have this discussion. Um, let me tackle the second prong of that question first. You know, what makes me think that a convention around animal protection is possible? And what gives me hope, at least in a personal sense, is that you know, the global development of animal law as a distinct area of legal focus, you know, one being uh, increasingly recognized as informing and being complementary to environmental law. And it was maybe five years ago that here in the US, you'd be able to count on one finger, you know, the number of schools with a dedicated animal law program. And today it's close to a dozen. Yale, of course, um, University of San Francisco, Harvard, Michigan State, and George Washington now with a note of congratulations um, to Joan for making that happen. And I'm heartened that a number of our own international animal law alumni have return to their home countries to reproduce that transform, transformational change you know, abroad. And animal law education is expanding and with it, the discourse around animal protection has and also continues to evolve. And you know, what we're witnessing as part of this wave is that states are interrogating not so much what, but who animals are as individuals, their sentience, their cognitive and their emotional complexity and in doing so, you know, disrupting this, this stubborn classification of animals as property as opposed to persons, if not dismantling that dichotomy in and of itself. And we're seeing scores of states ban entire categories of animal use, for example, in the arenas of cosmetics testing, um, the killing of seals for fur, whaling, with states going so far as to construct trade barriers and negotiate entire trade agreements around animal welfare and protection. And even further, you know, prohibiting membership in global partnerships unless states and specified animal use practices, specifically with regard to the EU, whaling. And so it's not just states with long-standing histories of championing animal welfare. And here I'm reminded of the, the Kavan case from Pakistan and the Islamabad High Court's ruling that the intrinsic interests of um, that particular captive elephant were implicated by the constitutional environmental rights of Pakistanis to seeing him as this constituent part of nature, to seeing him treated well. And so this, this recognition of the relational human and non-human animal rights in that country and um, to sort of key off of other comments that have been made so far, you know, this ruling was handed down in the midst of the pandemic. And I'll never forget that line from, uh, that fueled the court's rationale. And that was, that was what the, and what the opinion basically underscored was how nature had forced us as humans to go into this kind of, of captivity ourselves and was making us realize how our own survival depends on um, the well-being of others who are possessed with this the same, the similar gift, that gift being life. And so the court asked, you know, what has the pandemic provided us with, if not this, this singular opportunity to empathize with the pain and suffering of others, and quite literally to feel it as if it were our own. And I don't want to paint, you know, too rosy of a picture, but not only do I think that it's possible, but the foundation for it is being built, um, if in piecemeal, around the world. 
And so as to the question of, of usefulness, the usefulness of such a treaty, you know, I think I, you spoke to this, this point in your initial remarks, but I'd echo the Islamabad court's observation of our interdependence and interrelated fate with animals. And I'll take it one step further to say that, you know, I think we're past the point of debating the usefulness of such a treaty. A convention on animal protection is, is a must if the human race is going to survive this next century. Thank you, Raj, for that inspiring answer. Really great. Um, David, I want to turn back to you now. You mentioned CITES in your opening remarks. Um, and CITES obviously is a well-established framework that has done a lot of good um, around the world and provides a framework for nations to come together and discuss these issues, as you mentioned. Can the issues that the Convention on Animal Protection seeks to address be addressed by CITES? Or what, what is the gap exactly that we're trying to fill here? And you are muted, the perennial refrain of the pandemic. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, I don't think CITES is, is going to be the appropriate um, vehicle for moving ahead with this. They, they, within the language of CITES, there is no mandate to deal with such a broad issue as what we're trying to address or to, disease, or to deal with the issue of diseases and um, uh, viruses and being developed and moved about. It, it simply, it, it just isn't there. It's about international trade. And I know that there has been some discussion about what CITES might uh, do. And, and some people within CITES are, are suggesting they could do something, but other people are saying, no, that diminishes the, the role of CITES. Um, but, but I would like to say something about CITES that goes to how we're structuring our treaty. And, and that is the realization that a treaty is nothing without people. It's people that make something work. And CITES works because of the people that are part of that institution. So when you're drafting a treaty like we're drafting, you have to understand that you're, you're creating a space, you're creating a room in which people can come in and begin to work on this issue. And if we don't get people, and I hear here, I mean people, states, people within states, you know, uh, employees of states who have as their job and their interest uh, to deal with the issue of individual animal welfare and our zoonotic disease issues as well. So we have, we have, we are seeking to create such a space. Um, and the space becomes, this is what I saw at the CITES meetings, where, where people would come from various governments. And some would come with great knowledge and resources and information, and others would come for a first time and know almost nothing. And that became a place of learning, a place of um, negotiations, a place for all sorts of information to flow very quickly. Two weeks is a very short period of time for all these decisions to come out. And that's what all international agreements really have is these little, little windows of opportunity. And the other thing the treaty did was bring a focal point for civil society to come and add their pressure to trying to make things happen. And that occurred both uh, at the CITES meetings. Uh, I was part of 30 or 40 different organizations that would come and lobby on behalf of various issues at the CITES meeting. And then that evolved into the SSN, which was a species survival network, which then took upon training cit citizen groups in various countries how about how to promote CITES within their own countries. So it, it is the initial step of what will be a multi-year enterprise of trying to enhance the, the well-being of animals uh, across the board. Thank you, David. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll turn back to Raj now um, just to recognize, and this is something that we've discussed a lot, that there are a number of other efforts, past and present, that have sought to promote animal protection on an international level. And I wanted to ask you specifically about the Universal Declaration on Animal Welfare, which was first conceived in 2000. And by 2014, it had the support in principle of nearly 50 countries. It had the UN Food and Agriculture Organization supporting it, the World Organization for Animal Health. Um, so there was a lot of momentum at one time around the UDAW. How is the convention that we're proposing different from UDAW? And why do you think that a convention effort might move forward if UDAW has not been able to do so yet? Thank you. Yeah, and to offer a bit of context, so UDAW is largely a, a framework of non-binding principles concerning animal welfare. And 
you know, really it's, it's a fundamental vision and states who find the principles that, that make up that vision compelling can employ it either in developing sort of their own domestic animal welfare laws, or they can use it as a starting point in negotiating treaties with other states. But even if states were to, you know, develop a treaty using the UDOT text verbatim, it'd have no, it would have no operational framework and more importantly, no binding obligations, only considerations. And so technically it wouldn't be a treaty. And to be sure, you know, this lack of obligations made it relatively easy for states and intergovernmental bodies to approach and integrate those, you know, rather modest principles into their frameworks. And I'd argue that, you know, Utah was actually quite successful, incredibly successful, arguably, for its time and what it was and what it strived to be. And with that said, and somewhat as an aside, I do often wonder, you know, if the authors of, of UDA had drafted a companion treaty, you know, if only as an intellectual exercise, what would it have looked like? And, you know, how would it have presented its considerations as obligations? And, you know, what purchase would it have had with states 20 years ago? You know, now, you know, the CAP as it be is distinct from UDA because it does obligate states to take or else refrain from certain actions. And, the dialogue around CAP comes at this, this critical, this pivotal point in time, one where in light of the One Health paradigm and states are affirming that our well-being as humans is braided with that of animals and the ecosystems that collectively sustain us. And as I had noted earlier on, society's view of and appreciation for animals has dramatically evolved in the past quarter century. And states are increasingly realizing that the protection of animals is of a fundamental value to other states. And the second draft of the CAP, much like the first, seeks to be a framework treaty, one where the point of entry, meaning what states have to obligate themselves to in order to become a party to the convention, well, that will be quite low. So we'll have for the first time, at least, you know, this globally recognized floor for animal welfare standards. And those parties with better standards or specific animal use concerns, such as with fur farming or cosmetic testing, or you know even animal agriculture, you know they'll be free to one, you know, keep and or strengthen their own domestic welfare standards, and two, to negotiate protocols which operate like sub agreements within the convention with similarly aligned parties to the cap. So in that way, if the cap were to be adopted. The CAP would hold this promise of being this platform for global discourse around animal protection with each you know, biannual COP or conference of um, the parties advancing that discourse and thereby strengthening those protections. Thank you, Raj. And I'd like to go back to Nigel uh, now with a question about trade. Um, as we know, the welfare of animals is often placed at high risk when they're traded across borders. Uh, and even if a country signs up to the CAP um, or a treaty like the CAP, could it not then just import live animals and animal products from countries that have not enacted similar protections? How would you protect against that risk in the CAP? Thank you, Dana. That's that's a tough issue that we've been wrestling with. Um, few trade agreements address animal welfare directly. Um, there's some interesting arguments that WTO members are obliged to apply the the OIE Terrestrial Animal Health Code through the application of the sanitary and phytosanitary measures, the SPS agreement, because they're considered international standards, guidelines, or recommendations. But that position is still under debate, and the standards of the Terrestrial Animal Health Code are focused more on avoiding disease than on animal welfare per se. So in order to fill that gap, in the upcoming second draft, we've sought to achieve some extraterritorial reach for the CAP standards by setting out certain obligations on contracting states when they are negotiating trade agreements. We have an article which is called trade agreements. And the idea is that contracting states must ensure that the welfare of any live animals that are exported or imported pursuant to any trade agreement be addressed by a provision in that trade agreement that reflects the welfare standards of the cap. Similarly, contracting states must ensure that the welfare of animals whose products are traded be addressed in the trade agreement by way of a provision that also reflects the standards set out in the cap. And the idea, of course, here is, is a leveling up provision 
that would provide an important stimulus to non-contracting states to improve their animal welfare standards in order to be able to engage in trade with contracting states. So we think this could be quite powerful as a means of getting beyond the initial group of states who've signed up to the cap to a broader group that in order to uh, trade with the contracting states of cap have to improve their animal welfare standards. And at that stage, well, why not join the cap themselves? Now we address this issue um, actually head on uh, when as a group, we were invited to comment on the new UK-Australia free trade agreement. Now, as you know, following Brexit, the UK no longer benefits from trade treaties entered into by the EU and has had to embark on a massive program of bilateral trade negotiations. Now, as part of the draft UK-Australia treaty, it was heartening to see there was a separate chapter entitled Animal Welfare. However, when we looked at it on closer analysis, the chapter simply obliged the contracting states not to weaken their own laws, regulations, or policies with regard to animal welfare protection for traded animals or of animals whose products would be traded. And we identified seven areas where animal welfare protection was lower in Australia than in the UK and argued that the treaty should impose the same UK welfare standards for Australian animals whose products would be exported to the UK. If not, then the UK's animal welfare standards would be undermined and there would not be a level playing field as well for UK farmers. So it was uh, an interesting exercise, but I think one which informed our own development of the article that was um, uh, that will find, find its way into the second draft of the cap. But the idea here is leveling up and ensuring that we don't end up with a situation whereby uh, the cap or the provisions or the protections of the cap are avoided simply by trade with those states that do not have those same protections. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. And the, the UK experience is really interesting right now because of the new opportunities to negotiate those treaties. So thank you. Uh, we are going to turn very soon to audience questions. Uh, I am seeing some questions in the chat. You can continue to chat questions to me. And also at the end, we're going to uh, let the audience uh, ask questions directly. Um, before we do that, I just want to put a couple of questions to all of the panelists. You can jump in and make some quick remarks. Um, the first is about the sort of the evolution that the treaty has been going through. As you all know, the first draft of the convention was quite um, pandemic focused and focused in particular on zoonotic disease risk from interactions with wildlife. Uh, we publicly shared that draft and over the course of several months, we got incredibly helpful feedback from experts in public health and conservation and diplomacy and animal welfare. And it was I mean, as we all know, it was incredibly humbling and helpful, the comments that we got on the, the first draft. And we're engaged in quite a substantive redraft now um, of the convention. So could you tell me a little bit, I'd love to hear briefly from each of you and think of this as a lightning round so that we can get to audience questions. But what is something you learned from that comment process and the redraft? I'll go first. Um, I think uh, we were all surprised about how little we actually understood about zoonotic diseases and the risks they are. We, we had thought that there could be a list of animals that represent the risk, and if they were located, we could engage in management of those animals to reduce the risk. Uh, but our, our friends in the other parts of the world of science uh, let us know that um, that's simply not true, that almost any species could be a, a risk and where they are is not particularly relevant to, to the risk that they might impose. So we had to scrap a considerable portion of the treaty that was list creation uh, for various things and, and deal with it at a more holistic level. And just picking up, um, David, on, on, on those points and Dana, on your question, I mean, I think one of the other things we learned, which was very interesting, was um, how we have to be careful of the way we look about or look at zoonotic risk. And that I think initially some of the issues that we were addressing were largely focused on wildlife and the need to keep separate wildlife from commercial animals um, and dealing with some of the more obvious spillover risk areas, many of which arise in the global south because of the proximity of uh, human habitation with, um, with wildlife and with the commercial animals that they have. And I think the need to be more um, attuned and sympathetic to those concerns and food sources um, than perhaps we had initially been aware of. And I think the, the flip side of that coin was the need to 
understand that the zoonotic risk is not something that is unique to the global south and that with factory farming and the way in which we essentially feed ourselves today, that risk is equally present um, in uh, the massive um, factory farming situation that we have and that we therefore, you know, the focus that was more on the issues in the global south, we needed to rebalance that. And again, that rebalancing uh, we thought was best done by more basic principles that would apply universally, just depending upon the nature of the animal, an animal that's effectively under human control or wildlife, as opposed to uh, building down or, or breaking it down into different categories that, that ultimately could become, without us meaning to do so, but ultimately punish the or create more obligations on the global south and leave the global north and, uh, and its factory farms alone. So that was something that we really learned. And I think uh, we've, we've stepped back from that and tried to create something which is more balanced and, and, and as David said, more holistic. Yeah, and uh, I, taking up, I think, on, on Nigel's point, um, I think, you know, the convention was always animal welfare focused um, because to some of us that was sort of a primary, the primary concern is really adding animal welfare to the One Health uh, global approach. Um, but as, uh, as Nigel mentioned, um, we, you know, we were focusing on a variety of different uses of animals and having different parameters for those animals. And we pulled back on a lot of those details. Um, now those may in fact, of course, go into protocols, which will set, I believe, much higher standards. But from the standpoint of the, the umbrella treaty, um, we decided to, to go back and, and only focus on two categories of animals, right? Those that are under human care and those that are in the wild. Um, and we deliberately now are setting the same standards to apply to all animals under human care to ensure that all categories of animals uh, will be protected, um, whether they're commercial animals, companion animals, animals in research, or however they're being used, that there's at least one minimum standard um, that is going to govern all of those animals um, in human care. And I will say, um, you know, while it, they are minimal standards uh, in order to bring uh, every, you know, all states that have a variety of different uh, social and political and, and financial considerations to bear. Um, I do think that some of these, some of our provisions are actually quite, uh, quite positive, in particular focusing on positive states uh, for the animals rather than, for example, the absence of negative states. Um, and then with respect to, of course, animals in the wild, um, you know, we're focusing primarily on uh, establishing a system of protected areas to conserve and protect those wildlife, in particular, uh, to establish management practices which result in the least suffering and killing of wildlife, which again, I think is, is somewhat unique uh, for many, many nations, um, that they don't really focus on the individual, what the individual wild animals' interests um, and are really just focusing on, on their interests from a species level. So um, I do think um, that we have a really great uh, component, right, a complement to other uh, pandemic approaches that are gonna provide that missing link of animal well-being to the One Health link. Yeah, and another I'll point out is, is you know, equity. So this need to not just obligate states to support animal welfare, but to also equip them to do so. And so with respect to the second draft of the cap, you know, we're looking to include a funding mechanism whereby industrialized or wealthier states are obligated to empower developing states to engage in this work. And, you know, I'll adhere that for me as an animal advocate, and I think the same, you know, holds true for my colleagues here. Um, you know, my moral compass doesn't direct me to protect animals based on, you know, where they are in the world, um, their nationality, so to speak, but rather on the fact that they need and merit protection. And so, you know, just pragmatically, if, if not also morally, we have to equip, empower, and incentivize all states to be engaging in this work. Thank you all. That was, that was really helpful and interesting.